All right. Those people are crazy, aren't they? You, what's really sad is I know people like that. That's the bad part. And it's great to have you here today. It's good to be back from a couple of weeks, taking a little bit of a break. And so we're going to continue on in our series called At the Core. And what we're doing is we're looking at the core values of our church, the 10 core values that really define and help keep us on track towards the vision that God has given us as a church body. And it's interesting, as we began to establish these core values several months ago, that the Lord also challenged me regarding having personal core values, that, you know, it's important for us to have core values in our life, to have the non-negotiables of our life. And uh, so I encourage you, as we walk through these 10 core values, that you take some of them and kind of adapt them and and, uh, use them in your own life and maybe narrow the list down to three or four that are the non-negotiables for your own life. But today we're going to be talking about serving. And uh, three weeks ago, we looked at the core value of unity and the importance of unity within the body of Christ. And really, when you look at the success of the early church and the impact that the early church had in the book of Acts, you'll notice that one of the key things or one of the common denominators that they had was that there was a unity. They were together. And uh, we see that they were together in the upper room. They came out. There was a sense of unity. They were all together, one heart, one mind, one accord. And as a result, the Bible says that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Two weeks ago, Pastor Eric shared, and we talked about having excellence. And, and you know, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. Do you believe that? And at Living Waters, it's important for us that the things that God has called us to do, we want to do those things well. We want to do those things with all of our heart. And then Pastor Angie last week shared and talked about having an attitude and a spirit of humility that we never would be people that would be arrogant or prideful, but that we always operate in the spirit of Christ and a spirit of humility. And that brings us today to our fourth core value, and that is the core value of serving. Now, I don't know if you've ever really noticed, but the things in the world and the things in the scripture are completely different. If you even really think about it, Jesus said a lot of things that go totally against the grain of our natural thinking. Jesus said things like this, that if you give, you'll receive, that if you forgive, you'll be forgiven. And, and so there are almost paradoxes that we hear and that we, you know, we, we kind of think about in our lives that, that don't always make a lot of sense, but at the same time, they're kingdom principles for us to live by. And when it comes to this area of serving, this is one of those areas where Jesus says this. He says, if you really, really want to be great, then you've got to learn to be a servant. You've got to learn to serve. Now, I'm going to need some good amens. It's been a couple of weeks, and so I'm going to need some good amens every now and then, all right? Now, I kind of sounded weak. We'll try this side over here. I'm going to need some good amens every now and then. Amen. All right, that's a whole lot better. But think about it just for a moment. How do we define net worth? In our world today, you hear a lot with regards to economy and different things like that. How do you define net worth? Well, we talk about net worth, and it's the accumulation of the wealth or the things or the investments that we have. But Jesus described and really defined the net worth a completely different way. He said, if you really, really, really want to be great in the kingdom, you've got to be a servant. That's what real net worth is all about. And God orchestrated the body of Christ much like a human body, that it functions similarly, and that the body of Christ, when we come together, that it's made up of different parts, of different members, and that those different parts and those different members serve one another, that they come together, and within the body of Christ, it provides productivity and functionality, and it also provides the life source. And within the body of Christ, as we establish these core values and we take these kingdom principles that we're looking at, when we implement those things, it provides life within the body of Christ. And serving is one that is absolutely paramount within the body. It's absolutely paramount within the church. Now, we're going to look at a scripture, and before this uh, service is over, you're going to know this scripture. I mean, you're going to at least know, go home today, and if you don't learn anything else, you're going to learn this scripture. So if you have your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 4 We're going to look at verse 10. I'm actually going to read this from the New American Standard Version. But 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse 10, it says this, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Let me just read that to you again, and then we're going to kind of come back and we're going to really talk about this here. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now look at this. Let's just talk about this here for a second. Look at the very, very first part of that. 
Each one. Everyone say each one. Each one of you have been given and you've received a special gift. There's nobody exempt in here today. Every single person that can hear me, everyone sitting in this room, each one of you have received a special gift. And there may be some of you that are sitting out here today and you're saying, well, I don't know what my gift is. I I don't know what I'm good at. I don't know what God has given me. And maybe it's that you just don't fully understand that God has given you a lot and that there may be some things that are in your life that are just completely dormant. There may be some gifts that are kind of under the surface. There may be some abilities that are in the surface that you don't even know about. It doesn't mean just because you don't know about them doesn't mean that God hasn't given them to you. There have been gifts that I've realized over the years that God has given me that if you would have asked me 15, 20 years ago, I would never have thought I had them. But there were things that were just kind of dormant in my life and through spiritual maturity and my growing process and growing in the Lord, those things begin to get uncovered. And every single one of you here, each one of you, you guys with me, amen? Amen. Each one of you have received a special gift. Look at this. As each one has received, it means you've been given, that God has given this to you. And not only when we see this word received, it means that you've taken it and that you haven't rejected it, that you have taken it. Each one has received a special gift. Now, I love this word, special gift, because the Greek word here is the word charisma. Now, when we think of charisma, we think of somebody like with a magnetic personality. Have you ever met somebody and they're just like really boisterous and people are just drawn to them and they're just kind of out there with their personality and we say things like this, boy, that is a charismatic person. You know what I'm talking about? And we define people that are super energetic like that as people that are, have charisma or we've even defined different movements within the church. Maybe you've heard of the charismatic renewal or the charismatic movement. How many of you have heard things like that? Now I'm going to rock your world for some of you that have a Methodist background or a Presbyterian background or a Baptist background or a Catholic background. I've, I've always been kind of Pentecostal charismatic, so I'm going to just shock some of you that whatever background you're from, all of you are charismatic. And you're like, uh-uh, not me. There's no way I'm charismatic. Yeah, look what the Bible says. You've received a special gift, a charisma. There's a charisma, there's a special gift that you have received, that God has given you. Now, here's the interesting thing about this special gift. It's a gift of grace. It's a gift of grace. Here's, there's nothing that you've done to deserve it on your own. And so in saying that, there's no reason for us to get prideful or arrogant about what God has given us. You know, one of the gifts that I have is communication. Some of you may debate that with me, but... One of the gifts God has given me is preaching, teaching. It's one of the gifts that God has given me. And so the worst thing that I could do is take this gift that God has given me and be prideful or arrogant in it. I, a matter of fact, trust me, it's completely the opposite. I was just talking to somebody the other day. After almost 20 years in full-time ministry, I've preached thousands of times. And uh, after, after preaching thousands of times and ministry all these years... Every single time I get up on the stage, I still get butterflies. I still get nervous. Five minutes before I walked up here today, I sat there saying to myself, I just have nothing to say today. I just, I don't know what I'm going to say. I just, I just don't know. And so I've never wanted to get arrogant or thought to myself, I've never tried to get up in the pulpit and thought, I got this. Oh, I, I got this covered. Oh, I, I'm good today. It's just the opposite. I always get up and I'm like, oh God, if you don't show up, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm sunk without you. And see, God has given every single one of you a special gift, something that is unique to you. And I know there are some similarities in gifts, but look what happens when you take the gifts of God and you mix them with the additives of our personalities and the way God created us. It makes that particular gift completely different than somebody else. See, for me, it's preaching, teaching, and maybe for another person, it's preaching, teaching, but the gifts are so different because we're different individuals. We're different people. And so in saying that, God has called every single one of you to employ it. Look at this. As each one has received a special gift, all of you have been given a special gift. Look at this word. Employ it. Everyone say employ it. Say it one more time. Say employ it. Employ Employ the gift. Now, we hear a lot about every month, we, you know, we, we hear the new unemployment reports that come out. 
And all the news shows are debating in this 8%, 8.5%, and 9%, and this many tens of thousands of new jobless claims, and this and that, and all these different things. And we, we talk about 9% unemployment. Boy, this is horrible, or 10% unemployment. This is just really, really bad. But I'll tell you what's even worse is that there's an even greater problem within the church today, and that is spiritual unemployment. Amen. I know that's not a good place to shout amen, but listen, listen. Spiritual unemployment, meaning this, that we have gifts, that we have abilities in our lives, and we have things that God has gifted us in that just go dormant, and we don't employ them, we don't utilize them. And so what happens is we end up coming in the church, and we end up coming in, and we end up sitting down receiving unemployment benefits, and doing nothing. And God has given us so much. He says, employ the gift that I've given you. Put it to work. Men, do something with it. As each one has received a special gift, employ it. Now, I realize one of the reasons that people struggle in this area is, let me, let me say it this way. How many of you before you, you started a new job and, and like within the first day or two or maybe the first couple of weeks, there's always like a little bit of a sense of anxiety. You know what I'm talking about? Because you start the new job and you're not sure who all the players are. You know, you're excited about a new job. You're excited about a new opportunity, but, but you don't know, okay, well, this is my boss, but who, who are the other players that are involved? What are the policies? What are the procedures? What, what are the practices? How do they do things around here? And so as a result, you, you have that little bit of kind of tension. It's not frustration because there's an excitement in it, but you're just trying to figure everything out. It's the same way within the body of Christ. There are times that when we're called upon to do things and God asks us to step up to the plate, but we're a little bit hesitant and we're resistant because we say, you know, this might cause some uneasiness in my life. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing or I'm not really, really good at this or I'm not really, really good at that. So I'd rather just not do it than have to face some of the fear of doing it. And what happens is the gift goes unemployed. The gift is there and it's going unemployed. Look what Peter said. He said, as each one of you has received a special gift, employ it. Employ it, even though there may be a little bit of uncertainty, even though you may be saying to yourself, I don't know how to do this, or I don't know how to, jump in there with both feet. Employ it and put the gift to work. Look at this. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in what? In serving who? One another. Use it in serving one another. Because here's the thing, listen to me. I'm getting ready to get wound up. It's been two weeks. Listen. You can be a servant and you can serve without having a servant's heart. There are people that serve in the church, but they don't have a servant's heart. Because we think in terms of serving being about the action. We think about it being the work or the thing that we're doing. And trust me, I've met, I've met people before, not here, because y'all, all you guys are perfect. And... So it's not here. You guys are perfect and awesome. But th there are other people that I've met in the past that they work really, really hard, and they're some of the meanest people I've ever met. Seriously. I mean, they, they just have a bad attitude, and, you know, and they kind of have this attitude. They're walking around, well, I'm just serving the Lord. <laughs> I'm just serving God. Well, you might be a whole lot better if you stop and work on your attitude first, you know. Servanthood has much to do with the attitude of the heart. How many of you have gone to a restaurant before and you've got really bad service? How many in the past week? <laughs> on Friday nights, Christy and I do a dinner movie where we go out on Friday nights and we always see G-rated movies and Kung Fu Panda and things like that. Y'all need to wake up today, seriously. <laughs> I'm a whole lot funnier than you're letting on. <laughs> you know, tell us something we haven't heard, you know. Ha <laughs> ha ha, Pastor Ed. Real funny there, big guy. But we go out every Friday night and do dinner and a movie. And, uh, you know, that's, that's our date night. After 23 years, I still date my wife. And where's Matt? She's not here today because she's super sick. Be praying for her. She was up all night long. Trust me, I know. And she was up all night. I was praying for her all night long. <laughs> I 
believe in God for her healing. Anyway, she's, she's really sick, and she's lost her voice and coughing and hacking and all those kind of things. And, uh, but the car wasn't too bad to sleep in last night. Um, <laughs> Anyway, be praying for her. But every Friday night, we, we go out, and, and we do dinner and a movie, and we hang out and everything, and, and we love spending time together. But, you know, obviously going out quite a bit, we've had our share of bad service. Well, Bryce just got home. My boy's in town, and he's going to be here for the summer, Bryce and Aurora. And go ahead, clap for him. He's, wave, Bryce. There you go. Getting married in two months. Two months. And you know what they say about marriage? Man is not complete until he's married, and then he's finished. I don't know where this stuff comes from. But. <laughs> so we all went out Friday night. We went and did a dinner and a movie Friday night. Kids came home, Brooke. We all went out as a family together. And uh, so we're sitting. We, we went to Red Robin. We like going to Red Robin and getting those big fat hamburgers. And, and so we're sitting there, and we had waited for quite a while. And finally, the guy came over, and uh, Brooke had got pretty frustrated. She was like, where's this guy at? Come on. See, Brooke is exactly like me, but without 20 years of refinement. <laughs> so you can just imagine, okay? So she's like, come on. And she was, can I tell this, Brooke? Just, is it okay? I get in trouble if I don't ask permission. But it, it was so funny because she said she was there. She was getting so frustrated. And then the guy came over to the table and, and like her heart just broke for him. You know, because he came over and you could tell like he had just started. He was new and... And, and so Bryce actually, he came over, and we had waited for quite a while. And so Bryce said, we're ready to order. He said, can I take your drink order? Bryce said, no, we're ready to do drink order, regular order, everything. We're ready. And he said, okay. And he shut his book, and he walked away. <laughs> and, and so he, he, just, he just walks away, and, and Brooke's just like, and so finally he came back over to the table and we realized he was just struggling. He evidently had just first started and everything like that. So everybody kind of talked to him and made him feel better and everything like that. It ended up being a really good night and everything. But here's, here's what was unique about it is he had just started, okay? So I, I wouldn't rate him as, you know, a four or five star waiter. But he had the good heart. He had a really good heart. And even though his skill set wasn't quite up to par yet, his heart was right. And because his heart was right, it put us in a right attitude. Does that make sense? I know we're responsible for our right attitude, but because of his heart just being right, it just kind of diffused things. But we've all been around people, too, who we've got outstanding service, but they've had a really bad attitude. See, just because you get good service doesn't mean that the heart condition is right. There's a restaurant up north called Ed DeBevix. And if you go to that restaurant, you better prepare yourself that you're going to get harassed, picked on, called names. They'll just about throw food at you. That's, that's their whole thing. They just make fun of you. And their motto is, if you like the food, then ask for more. But if you don't, then there's the door. <laughs> there's a place. You know, like I want to go in and be criticized and made fun of the whole time. I already struggle as it is. You think I need to go pay for that? But see, you can serve and have a wrong attitude. You can serve and have a bad attitude. But look what it says, that we're to serve one another. And not when we're serving one another, have a right heart, a right attitude and right spirit. Now look what it says. Look at this. Serve one another. I want you to catch this. Listen to me. Because often what happens is God gifts people and he gives them abilities in their life, but yet they use those things that God has given them to serve themselves. Those special, unique, special gifts, the charisma, those special abilities, they take those things and somewhere along the line, they think it's because of them that they've done really good. When in reality, it's what God has given them. And he says, I've given you this gift. I've given you this gift to serve others, to serve others, bless others. You know, there are certain people, let me give you a good example. There are certain people and, and we, we make all these distinctions and we live our lives so compartmentalized, even spiritually, 
we, we just seem to compartmentalize everything that, you know, this is my family part and this is my church part and this is my Jesus part and this is my devotion part and this is my worship part and, and you know, here's my work part and this is my money part and this is my investment part. And we live our lives so compartmentalized and that's the wrong way because God owns it all. He, he owns all of it. And listen to what the scripture is saying, that we're to use the things that God has given us, that all the things that we have, God has given us, and then we're to use them to serve one another. And so you may have somebody who has, and man, I, I just admire people like this. There are certain people who just have a knack for knowing when to invest. You know what? I mean, we, we probably all know those kind of people. They just, they, they know the markets. They understand investment. They just know the right time to get in things and get out of things. And even with the economy and stuff, they, they just understand the right moments and the right things. And what happens sometimes with money is people get all built up and think somehow that it's because of them and their ability. And it's like I want to shake them and say, um, how do you think you got that? God gave it to you, and he gives us all gifts. Why? To serve one another. And look what the Bible says, and let me just show you scripturally. Let me tell you, this is how you back it up right here. Serve one another as what? Good, help me out. Stewards. As what? Good? You know what a steward is? A steward is someone who has nothing of their own. All they do is simply administrate what the master has given them. They carry out the will and the direction of the master. The master comes along and gives them resources and whatever that is, and they are to carry out the master's will and direction based on what the master wants. But it's not theirs. They're just simply stewards of it. Look, what, look, at, look at this. As each one of you has received a special gift, employ it in, serve, in serving one another as good stewards, meaning this, that the gift you have is not yours. Does that shock you? It's not your gift. It's not yours. God has simply given it to you to steward and use for him. My preaching and teaching is not my gift. It's God's gift that he has given me to steward for his kingdom. See, the Bible says you are not your own. You are bought with the price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And I know that everything that I have belongs to God. Everything I am belongs to God. Everything that I own belongs to God. And that he has simply given me those things. And the first moment I begin to think to myself that this is God's and this is mine, I've missed it. This is preaching better than you're letting on right now. <laughs> but we miss it. If somehow we think that we did it, we've missed it. It's what God has given us to steward for his kingdom. Now, can you imagine when we all embrace that type of mentality within the body of Christ and all the various talents and the gifts and the charisma all come into play? There is no need that is left unmet. Everything is happening the way it needs to happen. Why? Because we've been given those things to steward for God. So the question is, how are we doing at stewarding the gifts and the abilities that God has given us? How are we doing? How are we doing in that? See, Jesus, Jesus modeled the greatest example of this for us in John chapter 13. It's the story where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Many of you know the story. And, and uh, I, I, went, I, I was at a church one time, and the pastor had all of us over to his house one night. I didn't know what it was for, but there were about 25 of us, and we all went over to his house. And when I got there, I realized that we were doing a foot washing. How many of you have ever done, ever done a foot washing before? It is not fun. Okay, I'm going to be really honest here. Doing a foot washing is weird. It's, it's just, for me, for me, maybe not for you, but it's weird for me. It's just weird. If I told our staff, I want you to come over to my house Friday night. Angie, can you, can you guys imagine? I want you to come over to my house Friday night. We're going to have a foot washing. <laughs> they, they would wonder what was wrong with, they, they would think something had happened to me. Why? Because, you know, and, and we think, well, Jesus said that's what we're supposed to do. No, we're missing. Jesus said, I've set a model that you should do as I've done. He wasn't talking about, I want you to start washing everybody's feet. He said, I've set a model and an example for you to follow in servanthood and a servant's heart. See, our culture doesn't demand or dictate that we wash feet. But in that culture, understand, in that culture, everywhere that they went, they walked. They would walk down dusty roads and dirty roads and, you know, they had open-toed shoes and, 
And as a result of it, when they would go into dinner, and even how they had dinner and the way they reclined at tables, they didn't have typical chairs. It was like pillows, and the table was low, and so they would actually recline, almost lay back, so their feet were, you know, kind of almost at eye level with their heads. And so it was kind of their custom that there would be a foot washer when they would have a dinner. There would, it's their custom that, that there would be a foot washer that would be at the door so that when each person came in, they would wash their feet so that their feet would be clean when they were in the face of others. Clean or dirty, I don't want somebody's feet in my face when I'm eating. I don't know about you. That's just me, okay? But, but in this particular case, there was no foot washer and... and, and and the foot washer's job was the most demeaning job. It was the lowest of low. And Bill Hybels does a great job telling this story in his book, Volunteer Revolution. But imagine with me just for a couple of moments. Just picture this in your mind's eye. The first disciple walks in, looks down at his feet, dirty feet, looks over at the basin, and he notices there's no foot washer in the house. There's nobody there, so he thinks to himself, because it's decision time, he's got a decision to make. What am I going to do? What am I going to do in this situation? Oh, man, what do we do here? He thinks for a moment, he says, you know what, that's a little bit too much of a demeaning task for me. I'm a disciple. I'm one of Jesus' followers. There's no way that I'm going to wash anybody's feet. He walks over and takes the second best seat in the house, leaving the first seat open for Jesus. Second disciple walks in and looks over and sees the other disciple, the first disciple that had walked in in one of the primo seats of the house. And uh, he looks down and notices that evidently the water is still clean and his feet are still dirty. There's no foot washer here. And if he didn't wash his feet, evidently he wasn't going to do it. I'm not going to do it because I don't want him to think he's any better than me. So I'm not going to do it. So he walks over. He takes the next best seat in the house. The disciples file in one after another. None of them do anything. They just simply all walk by the basin of water and the towel. They sit reclining with their feet up in each other's lap. And finally, Jesus walks through the door. Jesus walks in. He looks at the disciples. He looks down at the basin of water, still clean, towel still clean. And he looks up at them again. And I'm just wondering if Jesus was thinking in his mind, Sermon after sermon. Confrontation after confrontation. Illustration after illustration. And they still don't get it. Jesus walks past the basin. He goes over and he sits at the table. And he pauses and he waits for them to see if any of them are going to move. Nobody moves. Nobody does anything. Because surely... Surely as the master, they would want to wash his feet. Finally, Jesus stands up. Here they are bickering and arguing among themselves. Finally, Jesus stands up and he takes off his outer garment. And he gets a towel and he puts it through his belt. He gets the basin of water and he leans down and begins to wash the disciples' feet. I'm sure that there was a split second that they didn't know what was going on. And then maybe for a split second, they stopped all the arguing. They were trying to figure out what Jesus was doing. And then all of a sudden, it hit them. How could we miss this? Man, how how did we miss this opportunity? Man, I, I wasn't willing to wash my own feet or even my brother's feet, but how did I miss the opportunity to wash the feet of the Master? Wash the feet of Jesus. How did I miss that? Jesus washes their feet, and in verse 15 of John chapter 13, he stands up and says, Guys, let me just give you a quick little illustration here again. I'm at the conclusion of my earthly ministry, but let me just give you a little illustration and just share something with you. I've given you an example to follow. Well, what I've done right here is an example for you to follow. You see, the Son of Man didn't come into the world to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He said, I've, I've set an example here for you to follow, to do as I've done, to do for others as I've done for you, meaning serve one another. Serve one another. If you want to really be great, if you really want to know what net worth and have increased net worth in your life, has nothing to do with your resources it has to do with your servanthood it has to do with being a servant let me tell you why jesus was able to do that 
John Maxwell says in his book on developing the leader within you that Jesus displayed really three primary attitudes when he washed the disciples' feet. First of all, he had nothing to prove. Jesus had nothing to prove. You know why? Because he knew who he was. Jesus was totally confident. He knew who he was. He knew that God had sent him. He knew, who, he knew his, what, what his mission was. He was confident in who he was. Jesus knew who he was. He, he had nothing to prove. And I'm just wondering sometimes if we don't serve. You guys still with me? Listen, I'm just wondering sometimes if we don't serve because we're so worried about trying to prove our worth to somebody that we feel like if we serve that somehow it's going to negate or it's going to make us look like we're lesser or lower than somebody else. And so we try to prove our worth and we try to prove our value in life by doing things that really take center stage and by doing things that everybody sees. And Jesus says, it's not about those things. It's about serving behind the scenes. It's about serving in the background. It's about doing the things that nobody else wants to do. And when we have a sense of knowing who we are in Christ, where we say, I have nothing to prove, I know who I am, I know what my gifts are, I know what my abilities are, then we can be confident in serving. Jesus had nothing to prove. And he also had nothing to lose. He was coming towards the conclusion of his earthly ministry. He was on, he was on the downside of it. He, he was just about at that, that point. He had nothing to lose. Guys, here I am. I'll do whatever I need to do. I know my mission. I know what the Father has called me to do. I'm not concerned about everybody else. Isn't it amazing? We get so concerned sometimes about what everybody else thinks. We get so concerned. Well, that's not my job. That's not my job. That's not my job. Well, you know, we've kind of got a little thing on our staff. I'll say it from time to time. It's never not your job. It's always our job. If there's a need, meet the need. If there's something that needs to be done, do it. Serve. Give. Do what God is calling you to do. It's never not your job. Jesus had nothing to prove, nothing to lose, and nothing to hide. What a great sermon illustration that he provided for them. It's a great visible illustration when he takes off his outer garment, in essence saying, guys, I'm completely transparent before you. I'm completely transparent. Transparency increases our ability to serve. Helps us serve better, doesn't it? We're not hiding anything. We're not holding. We're not trying to prove anything. Here I am. God, I'll, I'll do whatever you call me to do. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Our family, we, we, we've always made that determination from the time Christy and I got married and with our kids. We will literally, we'll do what, whatever God tells us to do, we're going to do. Whatever. Wherever he tells us to go, we're going to go. What, whatever God says, we're going to do it. We never put stipulations on it. We never put requirements on it. I have friends and people that I know that, well, I'm only going to go over here and I'm going to only do this kind of job or I'm only going to do that kind of job or I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm way past that in my life. I literally, I'll do whatever God tells me to do because he knows better. And the life even that he's given me, I'm simply a steward of it. I'm just a steward of it. We do whatever he calls us to do. Because when he, listen, when I get to heaven, hang in here with me, listen, when I get to heaven, he's not going to look at me and say, boy, Ed, man, great preacher. Good job, Ed. Well, you really tore it up sometimes on the week. Sometimes on the weekend, he's not going to pat me on the back for my teaching and preaching ability, or my my leadership or administration or different things like. He's not going to pat me on the back for some of those things. He's not going to pat me on the back and say, "Great husband, great father, boy, good business guy, good businesswoman." Good worker, good usher, good greeter, good youth person, good this, good that. He's not going to do any of those things. The things that I want to hear him say more than anything is I want to stand before my Lord and Savior and I want him to look at me and I want him to say, Ed, well done, good and faithful servant. Servant, enter into your Father's joy. Enter into your Father's happiness. And that'll be, listen, to hear those words, will be all the reward I need. That'll be all the reward I need. That's all I need. So when we serve, we don't have to worry about impressing everyone around us. And you've heard me say things about this with regards regards to worship. 
And sometimes we need to examine our heart and our motives and say, Lord, you know, when I'm serving you, how do you feel about it? How, how's my heart in this area? How's my attitude? How, how am I doing in this area, God? God, on a grade scale, A to F, where, where, where are you finding me in this area of servanthood? Wherever you are in that, would you just ask God today to help you increase a letter grade, to help you move forward? Maybe some of you are at a B plus. <laughs> ask God to help you go to an A minus. Maybe some of you are at a D minus. <laughs> ask God to help you go to a C or a B. Well, let's ask God to help us move forward in serving one another. Bow your heads, let me pray for you. Father, I pray for everyone in this room. I lift them up and and God, in all of our hearts, there are areas where we miss it. There are areas where we miss the mark. And God, there are areas, even in servanthood, where we just miss it. We, we think we know, but we don't know. Lord, I pray that you would help us today. God, it really is our heart. God, I believe that every person in this room, Lord, I know so many of them, and I know this church, and I know the heart and the spirit of this church. God, I know their attitude. I know the, some of the DNA of it. And God, I know that it is in the heart of this church to serve you. I know it's in the heart of the individuals that are sitting here now. God, it's in their heart to serve you, to have a servant's heart. And God, I just pray that in the areas maybe where they find themselves struggling, God, that you would just help. They would just come along and, and give them a little nudge and give them a little bit of an encouragement, God, because I know that you truly have called them to greatness. God, you've called them to great, great things. And Lord, I know that it starts by serving. Bless them and touch them, God. Let me just ask you, if you're here today with nobody looking around, if you say, Ed, pray with me because, man, I, I need to say yes to Jesus in my life today. I want to get my life right with God. But today, I want to say yes to God in my life. If that's you, would you pray with me? If you're away from God and you know if you were to die now, you wouldn't go to heaven. Your life isn't right with him. Would you just pray with me, Jesus, come into my life and forgive me of all of my sins. Cleanse me and wash me. I want to know you better. Today, I repent. I turn away. 180 degrees, I turn away from my sin. My life now belongs to you, and I receive your life in me, the free gift of eternal life. Change my life. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me today, please.